and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime story, we shall be looking at the story of Auburn Calloway. Auburn was born in Washington DC on the 13th of December 1951. He was one of four children born to Miriam and Earl Calloway. Auburn was an extremely intelligent and studious child who always achieved excellent grades in school. He enjoyed karate, later becoming a black belt, but other than that spent the majority of his time studying rather than socialising. Auburn attended Stanford University and after graduation went on to join the US Navy. In the mid-1980s, when Auburn was in his mid-30s, his mother Miriam died. She had suffered from schizophrenia and paranoia and had been hospitalised for many years. Following her death, Auburn became estranged from his father and siblings, and despite an attempt at reconciliation in the 1990s, their relationship was never retrieved. At around the same time as his mother's death, Auburn got married and went on to have two children, a son and a daughter. By the late 1980s, Auburn had secured a job as a flight engineer at FedEx. He also volunteered for charities and worked in the local community. At that time, a flight engineer would earn around $80,000 per year and Auburn was on track to be promoted to co-pilot and then captain. That would see his annual salary increase to $150,000 and beyond. To anyone looking in, he was a successful and accomplished man. Sadly, in 1990, his marriage ended. The split was handled amicably and he tried to maintain a good relationship with his children and continued to support both them and his ex-wife. As he continued his role as a flight engineer, with the hope of progressing up the career ladder, it was discovered by FedEx that he had lied on his resume when he was hired six years earlier. It came to light that he had greatly exaggerated his flying experience with the US Navy, which, had it been known at the time, would have meant that he would never have been employed by FedEx. As a result of this, a disciplinary hearing was set for the 8th of April 1994. Despite the fact that Auburn believed he was the target of a witch hunt, he knew that in all likelihood he would be fired and his flying career would be over. Even in the very unlikely event that he could secure a job with another airline, he would need to start over. With the airline industry in a massive financial slump, the chance of a pilot who had been fired from their previous job obtaining new employment was as good as zero. So Auburn came up with a plan. On 6th of April 1994, Two days before the date of the hearing, Auburn decided to get his financial affairs in order. He updated his will, closed his bank accounts and sent his money to his ex-wife and two children who now lived in California. As a FedEx employee, his ex-wife would get a $2.5 million life insurance payout if he was to die while still employed. Auburn then went to work. He was scheduled on a round-trip flight from Memphis to San Jose and back carrying computer equipment. This equipment would end up at the massive FedEx sorting hub at Memphis Airport. The intricately designed cargo plane schedule meant that the large majority of planes would run on time to ensure that FedEx were about to maintain their well-publicized next day delivery promises. However, on this particular day, the return flight was kept in a holding pattern for around 10 minutes. This led to Auburn and his two colleagues completing over eight hours of flying time in that particular day. The Federal Aviation Administration had strict rules in place which meant that any crew who flew over 8 hours in one day would have to rest for at least 16 hours before flying again. This meant that Auburn and his two colleagues would be ineligible to operate the same return trip to San Jose on the following day. Auburn was extremely reluctant to note the correct times, stating that if the times were adjusted by just a minute or two, they would be allowed to fly as scheduled. However, the captain, aware of how strict these regulations were, insisted on all times being recorded accurately. Auburn was desperate to be on the same flight the following day and was determined to find a way to make it happen. April 7th, 1994 was a beautiful, clear day. Three other men were contacted to see if they could work because of Auburn and his crew needing to take the mandatory rest period. Captain David Sanders was a 49-year-old ex-Navy pilot with over 20 years service at FedEx. First Officer Jim Tucker was a 42-year-old who had also been flying with FedEx for many years, and Andrew Peterson was a 39-year-old experienced flight engineer. 
They all arrived at work at Memphis International Airport to complete the return flight to San Jose that day. Andrew, the flight engineer, was the first to board the plane. When he arrived, he found that Auburn was already on board. As a perk of their employment, FedEx allowed employees to get a ride on cargo planes free of charge, so this wasn't an unusual situation. Auburn introduced himself to Andrew and told them that he was catching a lift to San Jose where he was going for a short visit. The only luggage he had with him was his guitar case. Andrew started to complete his pre-flight checks. He noticed that the cockpit voice recorder, CVR, was switched off. He reset this and carried on with his checks. Slightly later, he noticed that the CVR was off again, without a cockpit voice recorder which would be used in the event of an accident to hear everything that had been said, the flight would need to be cancelled. Andrew decided to reset it once more and if it faulted again, he would call maintenance and the flight would be stopped. Soon after, Captain David Sanders and First Officer Jim Tucker arrived. Pre-flight checks were finalised, the cockpit voice recorder was now working and the flight was cleared for takeoff. Less than 30 minutes after takeoff, with the plane approaching an altitude of 19,000 feet, Auburn opened his guitar case in his position of privacy outside of the cockpit. Prior to the events of 9-11, employees did not usually need to have their luggage screened before boarding an aircraft. Knowing this to be the case, Auburn had packed several hammers, a spear gun and a knife in his guitar case. Auburn wanted his family to receive the life insurance payout before his employment was terminated, but knew that if he took his own life, that would not be the case. Auburn had formulated a devastating plan. He decided that he would attack the crew with hammers, take control of the plane and crash it into the Memphis headquarters of FedEx. Any injuries that the crew sustained would be indistinguishable from those received in the plane crash, and FedEx would be destroyed by what would universally be perceived as a tragic accident. Had the original crew been able to fly that day, Auburn would have been with only two other crew members sat directly behind them in the flight engineer's seat. As it was, there were three other men on board the plane and Auburn was in a seat outside of the cockpit. Whilst this made it more difficult for him, with the hearing scheduled for the following day, Auburn knew this was his only opportunity to execute his plan. While the plane was still ascending, Auburn walked into the cockpit and struck Andrew in the head with the hammer multiple times. As Jim turned to see what was going on, Auburn struck him on the left side of his head with the hammer. Auburn then turned to David and landed a blow to David's head, which knocked him unconscious. Amazingly, despite sustaining significant blows to their heads, both Jim and Andrew were still alive. Trying to gain complete control of the situation, Auburn rushed from the cockpit to retrieve his spear gun. As Auburn returned, Andrew, despite having a fractured skull and suffering from tunnel vision and audio disturbances, managed to grab the tip of the spear gun and tried to wrestle it away from Auburn. As the fight continued, Jim got an idea. He put the aircraft into a steep climb which threw Andrew, David and Auburn out of the cockpit. Andrew and David continued to fight with Auburn. David was still disorientated from being knocked unconscious. In addition to his fractured skull, Andrew's temporal artery had been severed and he was losing a lot of blood. It wasn't long before the uninjured Auburn started to overpower the two men. Jim, who was an ex-Navy flight instructor, knew that he couldn't risk Auburn gaining control over him, his colleagues, and ultimately the airplane. During the initial assault, the hammer blow had fractured Jim's skull and embedded pieces of skull fragment into his brain. Still flying the plane, he was starting to lose feeling and control over the right side of his body. Despite this, he started to complete some complex aerobatic maneuvers. This was to prevent Auburn gaining his balance and then taking control of the aircraft. Jim violently rolled the plane from left to right before turning the plane almost upside down and eventually placing the aircraft into a deep dive. The aircraft, a DC-10, had never been flown faster. The plane was completing a barrel roll at nearly 400 miles per hour, something way beyond the aircraft's tested ability. With only one function in hand and the aircraft travelling at 100 miles per hour over its maximum safe speed, amazingly, Jim managed to retrieve the aircraft from its dive and levelled off at approximately 5,000 feet. He contacted the Memphis Centre and informed them of the situation. Whilst plane hijacks were more common in the 1990s, a hijacked cargo plane was virtually unheard of. The fight to contain Auburn continued, with both David and Andrew seriously injured, it was becoming impossible for them to control Auburn. They needed help from Jim. Jim tried to engage the autopilot, but the plane had become so unstable at this point that it would not work. 
He had no choice but to leave the cockpit and help try to subdue Auburn. No one was in control of the plane. As the air controller tried and failed to make contact with the plane, the ground staff feared the worst. Believing that Auburn had gained control of the plane, they stood helpless, anticipating the flight crash. Meanwhile, the fight continued on board. All three men had significant injuries, but somehow found the strength to try to pin Auburn down, which allowed David to return to the cockpit and prepare to land the plane. The plane was over the maximum landing weight. He needed to dump some of the fuel. The jettison instruments to do this were on the other side of the cockpit and with his extensive injuries and the fact that Auburn could possibly break free at any moment, he decided to go ahead and attempt to land the aircraft as it was. As the plane approached the runway, it was too high, too heavy and travelling too fast to safely land. In order to divert to a longer runway that was perpendicular to his approach, the aircraft had to be turned dangerously quickly. David then simultaneously extended the landing gear, speed brakes and flaps in an attempt to reduce the speed of the aircraft as quickly as possible. Against all of the odds, David executed a successful emergency landing, bringing the plane to a safe and secure stop just metres from the end of the runway at Memphis International Airport. SWAT and emergency services rushed to the plane. The scene that greeted them was shocking. There was blood everywhere. Andrew and Jim were fighting to contain Auburn whilst David was sat in the cockpit in a state of shock. Auburn was immediately arrested and David, Jim and Andrew were transferred to the Memphis Regional Medical Center. Andrew had skull fractures and a severed temporal artery. He had lost so much blood he was barely alive. David suffered from deep head gashes, a dislocated jaw, damage to his right arm and had to have his right ear sewn back into place. Jim had skull fractures and was partially blinded in one eye. Ongoing motor control problems with his right arm and leg required multiple surgeries and years of physical and cognitive rehabilitation. However, his recovery has been more successful than anyone could ever have predicted at the time of the attack. Subsequently, the Airline Pilots Association awarded David, Jim and Andrew a gold medal for heroism, the highest honour a pilot can receive. Due to their injuries, none of the crew have ever been able to fly commercially again. Auburn pleaded temporary insanity to the charges that were brought against him, but was unsuccessful, and on 11th of August 1995, he was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. There was nearly a million dollars worth of damage to the DC-10 aircraft, however this was repaired and the plane has continued in service for FedEx. In January 2017, Auburn wrote to Barack Obama to request a pardon, mainly on the basis that he should have been found guilty by reason of insanity and received proper medical treatment. He claimed that he had been the one who received the greatest injuries that day. The reply has never been published. He remains in federal prison to this day. That concludes the story of FedEx Flight 705 from Memphis International Airport to San Jose International Airport in California. For those of you more interested in plane details, it was a McDonnell Douglas DC 1030F. The aircraft name was John Peter Jr. Registration November 306, Foxtrot Echo. As usual, any comments down below will be gratefully received and appreciated. My good friend Master Jeep Hightower has asked me to give a shout out to the Walgreens Westside crew in Birmingham, Alabama. Hello to you guys. There are other pharmacy outlets available, normally on the opposite corner of a cross section. But hello Walgreens. Thank you once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. An apology to Laurie Ellis that I didn't get to use the word garage today. She likes that word. If you've got any aviation stories, please share them. Thanks guys. Goodbye. <laughs>